I'm, first, I'm going to just state I've got a lot of slides, and I made this with the concept that if anyone has sufficient interest, and I think this is a high interest topic because like Chris Rock said, when people used to disparage uh, homosexuality and he said, everybody's got a cousin, what's the problem, you know? And dementia is sort of like that. Almost everybody has someone in their family or someone they've known well who have suffered from it. So I made a PDF and it's also listed on the website for Science Circle. Um, and I tried to make these slides as uh, standalone for perusal so that you could go and review them, look up more carefully on issues that you wanted to see a little more information or look at the references um, for leads or guidance into finding more information. So I'm going to hit on a lot of things glancingly as I go through these slides. This first slide, I just thought, just for semantics, I thought it would be worthwhile pointing a few things out. One thing is syndrome. You often hear the word syndrome. Syndrome is not a very strong word. It basically means you see something, you don't know what it really is. Disease has usually a more defined etiology and um, the uh, symptoms are better understood. The rest of this you can read for yourself. I'm not going to read the slides. But I'm going to just uh, paraphrase uh, the points I think are important. On the second slide, it's just a listing of some of the topics I'm going to hit on in terms of etiologies. There are over 400 known etiologies for dementia. Dementia is sort of a syndrome, whereas a lot of disease processes will lead to it. Uh, there are many conditions that are like this that have uh, degenerative processes leading to common outcomes, because when a system gets damaged and whittled down, its levels of function become more and more limited, and the range of function becomes more Similar, I guess. All right. Areas of the brain, just so that we're talking about the same things. Um, as an interesting point, I thought from uh, the triune brain of, in the 1960s, Paul McLean wrote about the triune brain, which um, refers to well, some people talk about the uh, heart, head, gut, the head, heart, and gut brain. Um, also, the reptilian brain, the uh, paleomammalian brain, or uh, sort of the limbic brain, and the uh, neocortex. Neocortex is all your thinking gear. And the reptilian brain is. Um, they, this has been tortured a little bit because Carl Sagan made a comment about it. And, uh, uh, but it's kind of interesting. He, uh, and he talked about nuclear weapons and um, uh, the reptilian brain or, uh, that we all carry around deep inside us uh, involving brain stem and cerebellum. But I think it has to include limbic system. A, a simpler limbic system than in higher organisms, uh, but uh, uh, reptiles are not totally um, uh, organic machines. Um, the paleomammalian brain includes the limbic system, which is uh, involved with uh, learning along with the hippocampus, amygdala, and hypothalamus, and a lot of emotions are um, based or dependent on function in that level, and then the neocortex. The neocortex here, you have all these foldings of the lobes, the frontal lobe, which is um, where people say you make your executive decisions, and the parietal lobe, you have the sensory motor and the uh, uh, sensory and, and the motor cortex adjacent to one another. 
and occipital lobe in the pa in the back and the temporal lobe um, uh, on each side and there are cell site like the lateral uh, fissure and central sulcus that separate uh, various lobes. The occipital lobe is kind of interesting. I can just throw in a little story here and there. I had a patient, a uh, resident, came into the emergency room and I was on duty. Uh, he had been hit and he was brought in. Uh, he had been hit in uh, the back of the head uh, with a baseball bat and um, uh, was blind. And uh, he basically had a contusion of his occipital cortex. Next morning he could see. That was a wonderful thing. It recovered. But uh, your brain can't take too many whacks like that. You get uh, your oatmeal jarred and you get uh, axonal shearing and damage of all these little fine dendritic uh, connections. And um, so, um, let's see. I gotta remember which button to click here. You have certain areas of neocortex. Uh, yes, that was a hit on the back of the head, uh, the part of the skull where he would have uh, the skull um, jolted forward so his occipital cortex would get compressed. Um, uh, you have dedicated areas like Brokaw's area and Wernicke's area for speech, uh, word uh, uh, understanding and uh, speech processing, uh, and auditory cortex and some of those uh, can't be made up for if they're lost due to stroke or anything like that. You also have ventricles or fluid-filled spaces in the, uh, in the brain. You really don't have lymphatics in the central nervous system, but you have two large lateral ventricles, uh, which are uh, in each hemisphere in the forebrain or the uh, um, prosencephalon. Uh, it's actually uh, the, of the prosencephalon. This is a telencephalon part we're talking about. Uh, these ventricles uh, are symmetrical, and they, uh, it's, the embryo uh, doesn't even have uh, dis, uh, defined hemispheres in the neural uh, uh, clump that's turning into brain um, until two months. And uh, it's pointed out because I think it's uh, worth noting that embryos are not babies. Um, propaganda uh, and uh, false uh, semantics will make arguments about that and you can believe what you want but they're not babies they're not uh, first three months is the embryonic stage and then it's a fetus of second six months of the uh, terms but at any rate um, Going on, neurons, uh, just to talk a little bit about its structure. They have a soma or body with a lot of dendrites that can hook up with uh, a lot of other neurons and take in um, information. And it processes it and weighs it and then it shoots it down an exon. You can trick neurons into having more than one axon, but generally they have just one axon um, in uh, human anatomy in, in particular. If it's a myelinated cell and can do it much quicker, it has this deionization process that runs down the cell membrane but it can jump, the, the impulse can jump from node to node of these uh, little spaces between the myelin sheath that are created by the oligodendrites. Uh, those are called nodes of Ranvier. You get multiple sclerosis, you get uh, autoimmune attacks on your uh, myelin and uh, oligodendrites and uh, it causes sensory and motor uh, dysfunction. 
the cell types, aside from the neurons, uh, very important. Uh, these appendable cells, I won't go much uh, about this, but uh, they're in the, they're lining the ventricles and uh, in ventricles, there's an area called the uh, uh, choroid plexus, which is where the CSF or cerebral spinal fluid is produced. It's very similar to uh, uh, serum, except it doesn't have protein unless you got an infection. Shouldn't have blood or white blood cells or and some other things too, but uh, um, uh, and um, I guess one way to, if you have a leak of fluid from the um, middle ear to the external ear through a perforation, or you know, you think somebody has serositis, just middle ear fluid, and you put a tube in, and they get leaking. And you test that, and if it has a lot of glucose in it, then that's uh, cerebral spinal fluid. It's not middle ear fluid. Microglial cell is a big actor. It is a, it's your killer cell. It's, it's the uh, earner for inflammation. So you want them to be doing their job and facilitating, but not attacking. Um, the astrocyte is a supporting cell, and it helps maintain everything, this, uh, facilitates uh, a lot of functions, and the oligodendrite uh, wraps itself around the axons. Here's a slide which defines a little better what each of these cell types, I left off the appendable cells, I can, and this hasn't rezzed for me yet, but uh, glial cells are these uh, uh, non-neurons in uh, the central nervous system, but they are all from neuroectodermal derivatives, meaning when the um, uh, embryo is just a three-dimensional disc-shaped thing on the dorsal, it has an orientation, ventral and dorsal. Ventral is the front, the dorsal is the back. It's a way to think of and it, that will be maintained to adult form. Uh, Epithelial cells on the outside are ectoderm, and those enfold and form a neural tube. And then that undergoes all kinds of uh, uh, morphologic change, uh, developing into the central nervous system, including the ventricles and everything else. Um, so uh, any questions for the moment at, at this point? Dementia, what is it? Um, defining it as a trick. Uh, basically, you lose, you lose your ability to figure things out and uh, process the way you had been doing. It can present in lots and lots of ways. There are, like I mentioned, I think 400 plus uh, etiologies for dementia. So you can have sort of defining uh, uh, arrays of um, presentations and a lot of other things seemingly left normal. Categorically, cerebral vascular disease, which is of which this multi infarct dementia is uh, um, associated, it's the second leading cause of dementia. And Alzheimer's is the most common, and uh, Alzheimer's itself is part of another uh, category. This slide just lists some of the main um, etiologies associated with dementia. I'll point out that AIDS, uh, HPV infection untreated, uh, can lead to dementia or be associated with dementia, and that's accelerated apparently by meth. Uh, I'm going to focus on the ones that are um, 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 in bold print. Cerebral atrophy is a category that includes Alzheimer's. Al I should be consistent and say Alzheimer's disease, but uh, in this case I didn't. Um, I'm going to tell you about some of these others. Is this pace okay? 
Anybody? Is the pace I'm going okay? Good. Frontotemporal dementia basically lose cells and get shrinking or atrophy of the frontal and temporal lobes of that part of your neocortex particularly. That is historically a disease called uh, Pick's disease. Um, uh, there's a number of, uh, uh, there's been ongoing discussion coming to a consensus that gets revised and rehammered and uh, classifications is a significant part of the community activity known as science. So there are other um, types of presentations, other terms that are more specific to uh, a specific presentation, but uh, would fall under this uh, category of frontotemporal uh, dementia. I'll mention semantic dementia in a moment, because I, again, because I think that's interesting. Corticobasilar degeneration, the basal uh, uh, ganglia are, um, you have the cortex and they relate to clumps of specific cells uh, referred to as basal ganglia, which uh, has also been reclassified uh, to include substantia nigra, which is get down there in the midbrain. But um, um, there's an interesting word I thought I would throw in here, nosology from nosos, for, it's Greek for disease. I think this came around in the 1700s or so, but it's the study of classifications of diseases in medicine is referred to nosology and they talk about it. So nosologic arguments have led to inclusion of this disease in this category. So if you'd like words, there's one for you. It might show up in your next puzzle. So more about frontotemporal dementia. I, I just put that at the top for um, keeping people on track. Um, Semantic dementia is kind of interesting. They talk about uh, loss of conceptual knowledge. I remember uh, I took an abnormal psychology class in uh, college, and uh, one thing our uh, professor kept emphasizing, and maybe it was in his experience, that the last thing people tend to lose is the thing that had been most natural and deep, most deeply ingrained and integrated into their makeup. Uh, horrible joke about, um, you know, brain injury or surgery on the brain that uh, I don't think was told by a doctor. I read it once and somebody said, there goes the piano lessons. And, uh, but that sort of uh, reflects this sort of concept. Um, I don't like jokes about this stuff. Because uh, I'm not, I'm not criticizing anybody. Uh, I love chocolate. I'm not, I'm not referring to that. I'm, I'm thinking of my own personal experience of uh, really coarse things I've heard people say when they were looking at somebody's tragedy. It just ticked me off. Brain MRI. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about. Brain MRI. Oh, I, I know you weren't joking. I, was, I, I noticed that just as I started talking to, about that. Um, I was talking about my own personal experience in operating rooms and uh, uh, like a child that had uh, uh, airway obstruction. We hear a lot about obstruction of justice. Uh, I used to deal a lot with obstruction of airway. And this child almost died uh, from a chunk of carrot. Some, a grandmother gave a child a chunk of carrot and she aspirated it and uh, he couldn't get it out. We had to shove it down into the uh, right main stem bronchus uh, to be able to ventilate her to get her oxygenated better. Um, and uh, then got a hold of it and brought it out uh, uh, when she was more stable. And um, this damn anesthesiologist said, 
uh, as she was waking and see if she's going to be a Republican or a Democrat. Uh, I just have listened to so much dreck over my years. Um, people I would have loved to have just punched in the nose if I could have just been dealing with my reptilian brain. But um, you do that and you lose. It's like when you curse, you lose. If you get into a discussion. Well, anyway, this MRI shows the characteristics. This is pretty extreme. Uh, I've always liked looking at radiologic uh, figures, and I go to tumor boards uh, still every Friday, and we get scans and CTs. And um, this distinguishing characteristics I, I, I would see that struck me was atrophy of the brain with deepened sulci. You could see there was less substance to the brain. And here you have, especially in the front, which is at the top, um, loss of substance. And the ventricles, those big uh, uh, sim, uh, kind of curved structures that are symmetrical in, in the center, they're too large. Um, in the left one, you're seeing um, fluid is the white. Uh, so the, the dark is uh, fluid in this uh, um, uh, the two images on the right, um, and not um, uh, uh, the cellular stuff has uh, grayscale appearance. So this is pretty serious loss of brain uh, functioning brain parenchyma. Now that's a good point. It's easier to spell almond, which is what amygdala comes from. Uh, one point about Frontotemporal dementia, particularly, and these, this is one tragic thing. You got families that suddenly have uh, uh, a member that goes crazy, becomes promiscuous, and spending all the money and just behaving weird or uh, withdrawn or loses uh, their facility with speech. And uh, you see mental changes like that. It's that's really an important part of. Uh, Figuring this stuff out is um, uh, good history, and especially longitudinal history. Getting information to figure it out absolutely depends on a good historian and the family who accompanies the patient, because so often patients won't tell you about stuff. Uh, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about uh, uh, things people might be able to do to improve their chances of staying intact. So you see changes in behavior, changes in language. Social and language development go parallel. Children that have language delays often have a delay in social development. Uh, Asperger's and Alzheimer's, uh, Asperger's and autism are uh, uh, example of that and so in decline you can have the same thing. Um, Lewy body dementia, now Lewy bodies are uh, uh, a characteristic of pathological finding. It was first associated with uh, Parkinson's disease and they can happen in a number of places in the brain um, but there's a type of dementia that's associated with these uh, abnormal clusters of alpha synuclein. And they look like this. This is a Creative Commons slide. Uh, so I didn't have to ask anybody's permission. It was already granted. Waiting for it to, uh, there, it's resed for me. Uh, these, like upper left-hand corner, these uh, um, dark blob, that's, that's a, a cell. It's intracellular. It's a, a neuron that's full of this alpha synuclein uh, uh, inclusion. Uh, and uh, oh, one other thing. This is actually substantia nigra. And if you uh, look at this and you see what look like little dark dots, that's uh, neuromelanin. Uh, it um, uh, is uh, the reason it's um, it's the area of the brain that uh, um, is um, uh, it has 
a visible appearance. You can see it's a little darker. Uh, so it, it, uh, there's a, a type of cell that produces dopamine that uh, gets damaged in Parkinson's. Um, the synuclein uh, uh, SNCA gene for uh, the A is the, for the alpha at the end. Uh, synuclein alpha gene provides uh, uh, the instructions to make this little protein. Um, and uh, um, it um, is thought to have uh, some role in um, helping maintain the supply of neurotransmitter that is held in, in uh, presynaptic uh, vesicles. I misspelled vesicles there, but uh, my bad. It's not the last time I'll ever misspell anything, I guarantee. Um, so these inclusion bodies, I'm going to talk about this more, are generally associated with dysfunction of the cell. They actually tend to bugger up the cell by um, blocking axiplasmic flow these uh, synuclein tends to be uh, uh, down in the uh, uh, tips of the uh, axons near the synapse, and uh, it can uh, impair its function. It's, uh, by the way, once you run out, you don't have adequate uh, synaptic, synapt synaptic vesicles uh, with neurotransmitter, you are out of ammo. You're not going to get nerve talking to anybody among the other neurons in the area. Okay, alcohol. Uh, alcohol, ethanol. Don't even think about methanol. Um, which like uh, sterno, like uh, real down and outers will drink uh, mixtures that uh, just denatured alcohol or whatever just because they're so desperate. Um, but uh, alcohol is a neurotoxin, and I think you should remember that. It also is loaded with calories, and I know there's a lot of uh, stuff out there um, promoting alcohol in a sense, saying that uh, people who drink alcohol tend to hold up better, or they don't get resveratrol from uh, red wine and all that, but you need to be very careful about ingestion of alcohol and very careful about how much of it you ingest. Um, there's a very serious condition, uh, a type of dementia, wernicke korsakoff syndrome. I've seen patients with this. Uh, it has two conjoined findings. Retrograde amnesia. They don't know what they were, what they've done in their life, or where they came from. They can't, and, and that can be a varying, uh, uh, degrees of severity, and anterograde, meaning they can't learn anything. They can't remember anything. Sometimes there's, some of this is reversible if they simply quit uh, drinking, but these are people who have been abusing alcohol for a good while, maybe a decade or two, and uh, particularly with, with binge drinking. And uh, some interesting points about it. And get this to res here. That's the same slide as I had before, I think. Just about. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you ever worked, I've worked in factories back when I was uh, uh, younger. I also lived in a car and things like this. I had no address for times, but uh, uh, it's hard to do that when you're older. Uh, I don't think I could survive it now through a winter, but uh, uh, Rebolt's Law is, uh, he, he's uh, someone that's uh, uh, studied uh, um, the neurology of amnesia, but uh, he made an issue of the last and first out, just like in factory work. The last person hired is the first person fired. Uh, the most recent memories tend to go, and there's this old concept that uh, uh, senility, which 
when I was young seemed to be the common path in aging. Uh, people became like children again. And they remembered their childhood memories, and they'd end up wanting to tell you the same stories in and again. They were living in those days again. Everything else had been stripped away somehow. My phone just sang a song. Um, one last point about this kind of uh, dementia. Uh, impaired temporal localization of past experience. Everything runs together. Whatever they can remember seems like it all happened at about the same time. And it reminded me of Janis Joplin. I played a concert last night. Uh, I, pl I did two gigs last night. And one of the guys I played with, he's a, tr he's a trumpet player, but he actually he used to do gigs in San Francisco. And uh, uh, played with Jerry Garcia. And, and uh, Janis Joplin uh, he knew her. And he turned down a job as a drummer. Glenn Miller Band. Point. Uh, so this guy's pretty interesting. But at any rate... Um, I was thinking of that uh, when I saw him last night because I put Janice Joplin, with all respect to her, she has immense talent, but she almost certainly was alcoholic. She always had uh, a, a bottle of booze, usually whiskey, with her on stage. And one time I heard her say, it's all the same day, man. It's all the same day. And all these people would, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's all the same thing, you know. It sounded like a cool thing to say, but you know, that was probably the experience she was starting to feel. That's what has occurred to me in retrospect. So there's also something quite sad. She was 27, like Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix as well. She died. I didn't even make it to 35 like Mozart. Um, but... Uh, that's her picture when she was a child. There's something sort of sad that can happen when people age. And I want to run through something I, th I think is interesting, and uh, particularly uh, uh, the B vitamins. Just a quick jaunt through that, and, um, and if people want to look at it more, they can go to the website and pull up the PDF. But um, beriberi is historically important and was associated with neuropathy and weakness. And so uh, you got to have B1. They found that they have polished rice. It takes off the husk, and the, which has the uh, vitamins, and it's just starch. Uh, so if you don't B1, and in other words, take B1 and your diet especially, you'll be stumbling and numb with ataxia or uh, 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 trouble walking and uh, weakness, and you have a risk of dying of heart failure. Also, an interesting point was that too much coffee or tea can deplete it, but Bernicke, Korsakoff, these binge drinkers, they tend to have very poor nutrition. Uh, alcohol used in that much excess tends to supplant any semblance of a normal diet. And it also seems to have impact on how it's processed and even its absorption. So they tend to get severe vitamin deficiencies, and that causes degeneration and death of medial thalamic um, cells that are needed for processing memory. And the cerebellum, which is where you get the stumbling around. So at any rate, I thought that was worth pointing out. Alcohol abuse is a big um, reason or a big risk factor for B1 deficiency. Uh, I'll just run through the others real quickly, and I want you to note um, in the center column, I think it hasn't resed for me, but yeah, central nervous system uh, problems that can arise from vitamin deficiency, of the, like riboflavin, which is B2, uh, brain dysfunction, that's a little general. Uh, B3, which is niacin, you can have um, um, loss of memory, dizziness. See, it's still resing. Here we go. Um, uh, pelag pelagrous insanity. You can have mental changes uh, that are pretty severe. 
It's one of the points in this, so whenever we are dealing with uh, people, so I'm not in practice now, but I saw a lot of demented. Always tried to see if they evaluated properly. But um, uh, you want to be sure that you're not just shrugging it off and missing something that is treatable. I mean, that's really a horrible thing if you have somebody that comes to you for help and you, you miss it. Uh, so that takes a hell of a lot of time and it, it, a lot of energy. And uh, if you really do your job that way as a physician, you're tired as hell at the end of the day because it takes so much emotional energy to get into every patient's brain or the family's brain and figure out what's going on. Okay, um, vitamin B5. These uh, people that uh, designated the B vitamins were uh, apparently didn't like uh, uh, four and uh, eight and things like that. But uh, pantothenic acid, uh, which can cause encephalopathy and behavior change. Uh, you can get these B vitamins from lots of sources, uh, or you can kill sentient animals like this cow. And I, I threw this in just as a, I like this picture. I, when I was a kid and I was very isolated on a remote primitive farm. And uh, we had a lot of books, but uh, I had no kids anywhere, no people in sight. I was... A clear day, way down in this valley, I could see a little house off in the fairly vast distance. Um, when I was upset, I felt like the cattle were concerned. It was a, a deep instinct in me. I think that there's a lot going on in these uh, in the in the minds of these animals, just like they if a if a calf is making noise, they want to see what's going on with it, and they come over to it. Uh, they, uh, I don't know if they can cry, but they can sure feel fear, and they want to live just like you do. So uh, it's easy to eat them, I guess, if you don't have to see them get killed and slaughtered and skinned and butchered. But um, that's just a personal point. So B6 uh, is uh, also associated with uh, autonomic dysfunction and uh, uh, cognitive decline and dementia. Uh, alcohol abuse promotes it. Um, B7 is biotin, which um, can be associated with hallucinations and seizures and, and, uh, um, when it's uh, at a low level. Uh, this is a picture of a pig about to get slaughtered. Uh, so I put that in there. Uh, you don't have to eat pork to get biotin, but you can. Uh, maybe it'd be good if you had to do it with your own hands. But at any rate, this is something I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of the whole package here. <laughs> I am take it or leave it, but. B9 is folic acid, and it can affect uh, behavior and cause dementia if it's in severe, uh, uh, severely depleted. And Alzheimer's disease uh, can be uh, associated with low levels of folic acid. Um, B12, there's a lot of ways to get B12 nowadays. You uh, don't have to eat meat to do it. Uh, in the old days, like... Uh, in World War II, if you wanted to go in the uh, Navy and they found you were anemic, they'd say, uh, this, is, this is something that happened. Uh, go eat some pork liver uh, for about a month. And then uh, they would get a lot of B12 from that. But uh, um, got to remember, the people trying to go in the military in 1942, they had just come off of depression, and there was a lot of malnutrition in the United States. Um, but uh, B12 can also be associated with dementia. It's particularly associated with um, uh, megaloblastic anemia and uh, uh, 
lack of intrinsic factor uh, uh, that uh, helps absorb it in the uh, um, uh, GI tract and the same cells form uh, acids. So you have achlorohydria or achlorohydria, um, uh, meaning no acid in the stomach. And people with that condition, uh, uh, pernicious anemia like that, tend to get stomach cancers in the long run. One point I would make about B6 um, is that, um, and I'm waiting for this to res here, uh, it's supposedly uh, potentially injurious to large uh, uh, sensory neurons. Um, and so uh, you need to be careful about how much of it you take. And uh, uh, I want to point that out because I look at energy drinks and the content in energy drinks seems to be pretty high. Um, and fortified cereal, I would think so. It's fair, uh, yeah, I would think so. These are all water-soluble vitamins. And um, uh, if you have a normal absorption, if you've got an atrophic GI tract or malabsorption for medical reasons, you may have problems no matter what you take orally. Uh, but uh, uh, for the most part, uh, the B vitamins are pretty safe to take. I would emphasize also that uh, uh, too much niacin, sometimes people take niacin to uh, help reduce cholesterol. Uh, it's an alternative to statins, but you have to take a pretty high dose, but it is potentially hepatotoxic. So. Here is a list of the eight B complex vitamins, B1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 9, 12, 4, 8, uh, 10 or 11. So anybody ever gives you a, an IQ test and says, uh, uh, what's the next number in the sequence? And they say, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 9, you say 12. <laughs> So I'm memorizing the eye chart. Okay, so again, dementia, you're starting to lose your stuff. Um, dysfunction from uh, the expected, particularly the expected for one's age. Uh, and it can be in varying uh, degrees of severity, of course, and you, all that needs to be documented carefully. Uh, I'm gonna go into that in more detail. To more formally state characteristics of dementia, you got to look at this and think about how would you uh, create oh, a screening that would be applicable to any patient, any patient, regardless of their language usage or lack of language or um, uh, being of uh, uh, having a foreign uh, or a, a mother tongue that's different than the language in which you'd be testing. And uh, what about blind patients? Blind since birth, or the loss of vision after, um, um, ability to focus and pay attention, all these things can vary so much. Um, one thing that you can use, I really don't know of other tests. There are other tests, but I, I'm not familiar with them, but this one is one I knew of. Um, it's a questionnaire that can be administered to screen for dementia. And there is a score that's given even for people in a coma. And you think, how would you say that somebody in a coma has uh, dementia? Well, you, you can't uh, specifically uh, based on that. Uh, wouldn't want to say they have dementia until to see what their performance is if they emerge from the coma, really. But there is a score for someone in a coma who has no response. There was an old National Lampoons, which was a spoof type magazine. And Dan Blocker was hoss on Bonanza. And he was a big guy and died of a heart attack early on. And National Lampoons had an interview with Dan Blocker after his death. And they would ask him irrelevant questions, and then they would have 
they had it as questioner and then his answer. Every time they showed his answer, it was blank. And um, so it's sort of like testing someone in a coma, I guess. So at any rate, that's just for general information. Okay, let's talk about specifics. In 1906, this guy in the upper left, um, Alzheimer, uh, reported on, he was working out of uh, Frankfurt, I think, uh, in, uh, at a clinic, and he reported on a patient he had followed for about five or six years um, who had uh, severe dementia, and uh, she was young, like 50, early onset. So he reported this uh, to a group um, on the 3rd of November, 1906. And um, I have the, the details here. The symptoms, she, she had paranoia. That's not unusual in demented people. Paranoia, also guarding and trying to uh, cover up their uh, uh, failings. Uh, especially earlier on when they they have awareness, they have some insight and they don't want anybody to see it. And sometimes they confabulate. They'll make up junk just so that they're giving an answer and they're kind of trying to satisfy the questioner. Um, sleep and memory disturbance, aggression, confusion, all those things are very typical. And, um, oh, the one thing I wanted to point out, his paper excited little interest a few years later, he point, uh, reported on a few other patients, uh, um, later one without uh, some of the uh, morphological changes uh, on autopsy uh, and pathological examination of the brain. But uh, he died in 1915, never got to know that he was a household name, household word, uh, which is often the case. It's like great artists often uh, die in uh, despair and then get discovered. So plaques and tangles are the big deal. The plaques are the beta amyloid plaques and there are tangled bundles of fibers, NFT, neurofibrillary tangles, particularly tau tangles. I'm gonna talk more about tau and tauopathies. Dementia is associated with uh, abnormal tau um, protein accumulations. Major feature in this is loss of synapses. Even if the cells don't die, they just can't function. S synapses break down and um, eventually there's atrophy, loss of brain volume and uh, death at a point. Um, in 1984, uh, the criteria for Alzheimer's reflected the uh, viewpoint of the day. Uh, it makes me think of um, uh, how politicians uh, behaving badly when they're younger without uh, any realization of the bigger picture and uh, um, viewpoints change and sensitivities become more extreme and then they're in trouble, as we see in Canada. Um, at any rate, um, in 1984, memory loss was it. If somebody lost their memory, that was started, that would be considered probable Alzheimer's. Um, and Alzheimer's is absolutely confirmed on autopsy most often still is. But we're having biomarkers emerge, and that's really important. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. 2011, there was a, uh, another nosologic uh, um, coming of minds uh, to try to sort out what should be considered Alzheimer's. And so they revised the disease uh, criteria and uh, Getting it up to date, they talk about it in three stage, an early preclinical pre stage with no symptoms. You can have Alzheimer's and no symptoms. That's really important. That's acknowledging the fact that these changes start before are apparent. And then middle stage of mild cognitive impairment um, where there can be word finding difficulties and um, 
I've got a little bit more on that in a bit, but uh, uh, generally those people can still drive and uh, manage their bank accounts. And then the, when they enter the final stage, they become dependent on other people. Um, so word finding is, uh, I mentioned down here, is one of the other symptoms that can become uh, um, um, noted as uh, and lead to the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, not just out and out memory loss. Okay, these are busy slides, but again, it's uh, intended for people to be able to go back to them and get something out of them. Often slideshows, you just get bullet points and it, you can't go back and read much out of it. But um, um, they're, they also tried to acknowledge all these other things. You can have all kinds of multiple etiologies going on for a presentation of dementia. And uh, Alzheimer's may not be the whole story. Just like a person can have um, laryngeal cancer and a lymphoma at the same time. Uh, vascular disease is a, is a big player there, as you can often have people with Alzheimer's also have vascular disease, and it seems to potentiate the problems. Um, any ideas why uh, they did not declare biomarkers uh, as one of the criteria for diagnosing Alzheimer's? And the answer is they don't know exactly what's going on yet. I'm going to try to lead you to what the best, most intelligible current idea is in a few minutes here. But uh, I think that's an important point. There are no definite biomarkers. There are landmark changes like the t uh, plaques and especially the neurofibrillary tangles with the tau proteins. Um, but that's dependent on either brain biopsy, which is sometimes done, or um, a, a, um, an autopsy. Um, so here in the preclinical changes, you're starting to get amyloid or tau protein buildup, and other nerve changes might be apparent if you were able to look at it. But uh, um, get into the mild cognitive impairment, you're starting to have impairments in great areas. and. Um, uh, their problems are a little bit out of balance with what you would expect for their age. And um, also their background, you have to take into account a person's educational background that they can, uh, people with more education and uh, more uh, language usage uh, will tend to be able to offset any apparent uh, effects of Alzheimer's longer. Um, so learn and read everything you can. It's uh, every synapse you form helps save your life. Um, finally, Alzheimer's dementia is the final stage. And there's a lot of damage done by that point. Okay, I'm waiting here for it to res. Oh. In terms of genetic testing, this is a review. You have early onset and late onset, and there's a couple of mutations. Uh, in amyloid precursor protein, particularly, uh, that uh, can be detected by uh, uh, testing. Um, and if you have a family history, that probably is worth doing. But you only you have 5% or less, generally, is a typical number you see in the literature about how many presentations are genetically based. Uh, for late Alzheimer's, uh, late onset Alzheimer's disease, LOA, um, you have this uh, APO gene on chromosome 19. And um, it's uh, a gene that is, um, it's an APO lipopro, let's see, APO, um, apolipoprotein E. Uh, 
it's related to or one of these types of proteins that helps carry lipids in the bloodstream. So at any rate, um, there are various alleles that can be damaged. The uh, E4 uh, is one of uh, interest here. Uh, for this, these new criteria, they uh, don't recommend genetic testing for APO uh, mutations outside of research. Now, I have a friend who's a physicist who's the best mathematician I've ever known. Um, and uh, math is dear to my heart, so i positioned to appreciate his abilities. But uh, he was telling me... Um, I'm not going to say his name, of course, but he was telling me uh, he got testing and he was found to have uh, positive APO uh, 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 mutation on uh, one of the um, uh, chromosomes, but he was uh, heterozygous. Um, uh, uh, it was uh, just one chromosome. The other chromosome was okay. So he was enrolled in a study and they did PET scanning. I'll tell you about PET scanning for and um, I don't think his testing was 23 in me. I University of Pennsylvania or something. But uh, um, uh, at any rate, um, they threw him out of the study. Uh, he was somewhat depressed to be in such a study to begin with. But they threw him out of the study because his PET scanning showed no beta uh, amyloid uh, accumulations. So... Uh, that was a good thing, I think. So I want to talk about imaging techniques. There is so much physics and so much fascinating history in um, uh, the development of these things. Uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And, uh, uh, anyone know what gadolinium is? I was in a conference once with uh, someone, um, it was called pimping. They pimped, not pimping like on the street. Yes, it's an element. And I, I, knew, uh, I knew you would know. It's a contrast agent when it's uh, in a uh, coordination bond uh, system with uh, some organic molecule, uh, sort of like iron in the heme molecule. Uh, but uh, it's an element. Uh, um, a guy asked a bunch of, rel uh, of residents, they always talked about MRI with gadolinium. And he says, what is gadolinium? And nobody said a word. <laughs> but it's uh, element um, atomic number 64. Uh, it's a lanthanide. And it's right in the middle of the lanthanides. The lanthanides and the... Um, 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 I want to say actinic, uh, uh, at atonines, I, uh, shiza. But um, the uh, second, the, uh, the period seven, um, actinides, yeah, I was blocking because I had um, uh, other A words popping up in my brain. Uh, those um, anthonides and uh, um, actinides are uh, where the F orbitals get filled. Um, you can uh, figure out the periodic table if you can remember that um, there's one s orbital, three p orbitals, uh, five d orbitals, and seven f orbitals. They're odd numbers. There's an easy uh, calculation to figure out the maximum number of uh, electrons uh, in any shell if you do uh, the arithmetic progression of one plus Three plus five plus seven, uh, or um, uh, odd numbers up to up to seven, and um, double it because each orbital can uh, hold two electrons. So uh, uh, anyway, um, a, an element is paramagnetic if it has um, uh, unpaired electrons. It means it can take on uh, magnetic properties. Uh, gadolinium in certain situations can also be ferromagnetic. But um, uh, uh, yeah, gadolinium is a lanthanide. It's in, it's in that first uh, row of the F group or the uh, lanthanides of the um, 
it's it's in the um, sixth period, I guess, sort of right before you get recess, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's great as a paramagnetic uh, um, uh, element because it's got uh, uh, like seven uh, un seven unpaired electrons. Um, now, one problem with it, it can deposit in brain and other tissues, uh, and uh, there's concern about it damaging the kidneys. Um, and they try to make, uh, uh, downplay that, but uh, it's not trivial to give someone lanthan a, 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 a gadolinium contrast. Um, there is, there has emerged, and I've read about this, I thought it was a brilliant, uh, a, a, a ligand, now in, in biochemistry, ligands are generally molecules that bond uh, to another molecule or receptor, but uh, in this case, it's, we're talking about coordination or data bonding uh, a metal with an organic uh, compound and manganese is element 25 it's halfway through the, the uh, d um uh block meaning um it's got five uh orbitals and so manganese has five unpaired electrons so it's pretty good as a paramagnetic uh element um I guess because of the way the atoms sit together, the pure element of manganese is not ferromagnetic, but uh, um, they're too close together. But um, uh, manganese can become a replacement for gadolinium and uh, probably will. And uh, the testing they did, it showed no leaking in, uh, or loss of the, man mangan of the uh, manganese into uh, tissues. It was excreted through the kidneys. Um, functional MRI, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, um, there's iron. Iron uh, in excess can be dangerous, uh, um, uh, potentially toxic to but, um, manganese is, is a, uh, normally found in human physiology. Uh, the highest uh, element that's really a, a, a component of human physiology or mammalian physiology is iodine, which has an, uh, it's one short of uh, xenon. I guess it's, uh, uh, it would be um, in the, uh, the fourth, I think it's, let me see, the fourth period, but um, so I'm trying to think of have iodine, uh, uh, xenon, and then cesium and calcium, uh, cesium and calcium, uh, barium, barium, uh, and barium's a little heavier, uh, but iodide is an uh, um, atomic weight of 53, and uh, that's pretty dense compared to, you know, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, carbon, and uh, hydrogen. So it's... Uh, uh, pretty good for absorbing x-rays. Um, uh, contrast agents used in CT scans are usually with iodide. Um, uh, nuclear medicine techniques are really the thing that are so cool. Uh, positron emission tomography and these spec scans, which I, I don't see. I, I think that PET scanning is going to supplant specs uh, or uh, single proton emission tomography techniques. Um, just a quick note, um, another, just as Alzheimer uh, didn't get much note of his work, uh, CT scans are pretty cool. Um, uh, McCormick, uh, I, I'm not McCormick, uh, Cormick and Hounsfield uh, um, uh, are given credit for developing uh, the CT scan. Um, uh, the um, um, Hounsfeld is a really fascinating guy. Uh, he was uh, he's British, and uh, he was in the Royal British Air Force, I think. And then he ended up going to uh, he learned about electronics there and radar, and uh, then uh, 
went to the um, uh, Faraday uh, uh, School uh, College in, uh, uh, actually I think it's in London, and uh, which is respected among engineers, though he was, uh, I don't know, some have said he wasn't a certifiable engineer, he wasn't that level of training, but he was a brilliant guy and uh, clever and was on a holiday and he had an idea, if you had a, a box, you could see what's in it by shooting particles through it and looking at it at all angles. And um, it was a bit like Faraday, who was largely self-taught and learned by discovery. Uh, and uh, in my thinking, anyway. So um, uh, he also created the Hausfeld uh, uh, units, um, Hausfeld units. I'm going to Germanize his name, uh, I guess. But um, um, uh, that compares, it, it's a brilliantly simple um, linear uh, measure of absorption of x-rays. Uh, and um, looks at air as negative a thousand and water is zero. And um, dense cortical bone comes out to about a positive thousand. But uh, um, at any rate, uh, iodide is, um, or the uh, iodide contrast can uh, have uh, Hausfeld units uh, 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 over 300 uh, in its absorption. Um, um, barium is a bit higher. But it's a bit heavier. Um, so anyway, I thought that's another example of this, uh, so much interesting chemistry involved in this, in this stuff. Uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging was uh, first reported by uh, Raymond Damadian in uh, 1971, and he actually did the first whole body uh, MR images in 1977-78. One last point I'll make is other. I remember the first time I saw a CT scanner and they were just so pixelated. They looked like a, a TI 4A uh, a toy computer, which had, I think, four kilobytes of RAM or something. And it had games that would show block men, that, like Lego men fighting and shooting. And uh, they were slow. And the CT scanner was not much better. Um, General Electric got involved in that early, didn't save them in the long run, but uh, uh, one of the things I admire about humans is they see something and they say, we can do better, we can make this better. Uh, that along with just the intellectual uh, curiosity and uh, uh, discovery and understanding and artistic expression, I think, are qualities of sorry, somewhat despicable species we're in. At any rate, and you look at all the damage we do, magnetic resonance imaging with uh, gadolinium in an uh, organic molecule, uh, the, the Nobel Prize for that went to competing scientists. Uh, Demadian was totally ignored, and um, that was... Uh, looked at with some regret in the long run, um, but it seemed unfair. Um, but um, not that these other guys didn't do good work, but um, uh, I guess uh, fairness has nothing to do with it. Functional MRI, I think, is a beautiful concept. Uh, Ogawa is a Japanese uh, researcher. He used to work for Bell Labs, I think, and then uh, he's been uh, directing this uh, um, uh, research facility in Japan for a long time now. But he realized that uh, you know you have hemoglobin at um, the uh, uh, pulmonary artery comes out of the uh, right side of the heart with poorly oxygenated blood and goes to the lungs. And then the pulmonary vein comes back to the um, left atrium with uh, um, oxygenated blood. So you have deoxygenated or deoxyhemoglobin in higher levels going to the lungs, and it comes out oxyhemoglobin. And uh, Ogawa recognized that um, uh, there are different MRI 
uh, imaging attributes to each of these. So uh, he exploited that to develop a, a way to look at blood flow um, in the brain and the ideas that areas that are actively um, are more more active are burning off more uh, um, uh, energy, need more blood supply. So uh, functional MRI, I think, is here to stay. That's a pretty cool thing. And nuclear imaging techniques, I'm going to fly, I see, I've talked a long time here. Uh, the positron emission tomography uh, uh, can be used with a CT scanner or they, it can be uh, 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 mathematically fused or by algorithms fused with MRI images. I spoke with a radiologist yesterday about these things. Uh, when I asked him about uh, his current use of SPEC, uh, he said that they use uh, radioisotopes that are the same as for PET scans. They're not using, uh, uh, for, for brain, these um, gamma emitters, like radioiodide would be used uh, to uh, image the thyroid gland and, and the scans of organs that way using radioisotopes that emit gamma rays that can em uh, escape a patient have been used since around 1953. But um, uh, this I threw in just so you'd have a picture of this is a spec scan just showing how certain areas light up. Um, and in this, they were talking about uh, uh, this is from an NIH thing. They were talking about how uh, alter the imaging a little equipment. And uh, and the uh, resolution, but uh, you can see where um, can detect uh, levels of higher metabolic activity with uh, these agents. Now, the PET scan has about three times more um, uh, uh, sensitivity and high, higher resolution, and you can use the same machine as the CT scanner in a PET scan. So you don't have to put them in a machine, take them to another. And the um, um, so of, of, of fluorine, uh, fluorine isotope, which is produced by a cyclotron. Cyclotrons were um, invented in um, 1925 by Lawrence, who uh, had element 103 named after him. He was at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, and he was kind of considered the godfather of, uh, grandfather of um, nuclear medicine. Uh, the technology depends on being able to uh, create a, a short-lived isotope out of uh, what are normally uh, uh, normal metabolic uh, components. Um, and uh, I list elements that can be used, but just to keep going here. Uh, the decay is uh, involves uh, um, a positron and a neutrino being released. And the positron travels until it encounters an electron somewhere in the vicinity. And uh, um, uh, an annihilation event results in two gamma ray photons. Um, and the detectors it's like the same detectors for a CT scan are uh, encircling so you can get localization. That's just a diagram to the process. Um, the neutron goes off into the universe. So somewhere someone with a neutron, uh, uh, neutrino, I mean, um, they'll uh, say uh, somebody's doing a PET scan somewhere. That's that's flip. Never mind that. But uh, okay, the technology for producing these is really pretty cool. There's three naturally occurring isotopes of oxygen uh, with um, eight, nine, and ten neutrons. They take the heavy oxygen in heavy heavier water and bombard it with 
high energy protons from a cyclotron or a linear accelerator and they create 18 fluorine in or a fluorine 18 isotope in solution and they quickly bond it with a pharmaceutical and uh, they can inject it. It has a half-life of about uh, uh, 127 minutes. No, I was, uh, I was making a joke, uh, um, Synergy. Uh, I, was say, I was thinking that someone on a distant planet who can detect neutrinos might see, oh, there's a neutrino from Earth. Someone's doing a PET scan. So I was, I was being uh, probably creating. Yeah, I know it's a real nerd joke. Uh, okay, so there's a number of um, uh, theories about how Alzheimer's comes about. Uh, I'm going to run through those quickly. One is um, wrong, the cholinergic theory. The synapses get lost, so you can't produce cholinergic, um, um, acetylcholine um, neurotransmitter, and they thought maybe that's the cause of it. Well, that's that's or what happens, but uh, I, I just mentioned it for historic reasons and since as the depth of understanding became greater. Uh, um, Alzheimer himself noted uh, these clumps of, uh, and it, which turned out to be beta amyloid and it's um, from breakdown of amyloid precursor protein. And um, uh, nobody really knows what that does, it seems to be uh, concentrated in synapses. Uh, but uh, the pharmaceuticals that have been created to clear beta amyloid or prevent beta amyloid from accumul accumulating in these clumps or plaques uh, did not help. They were disappointing. Uh, so people were hoping that these would be uh, uh, cures for Alzheimer's or a new major treatment for Alzheimer's, but the neurofibrillary tangles are the um, real key, I think. Um, I have a few slides here which people can uh, go back to look at as well. Um, if you look at these uh, little tear droplet clumps, those are uh, mostly sick neurons, and these larger clumps are uh, like I don't have a pointer, but if you look uh, just right of center and, and uh, uh, about three-fourths of the way above the center, uh, you see these starburst deposits. Those are plaques, amyloid plaques. This is a normal picture on the, white, on the right side, you see white matter, which is just fibers. And on the left, you see uh, gray matter, which has a lot of uh, neuronal bodies. And you don't see any mess. Everything looks nice and orderly. The neurons look healthy. The uh, nuclei are not cluttered with junk. Uh, right there in the center, when this gets uh, resed, uh, you can look and you see tangles of filamentous tangles uh, forming uh, and uh, this is one is silver stain of uh, showing uh, the tangles uh, in uh, uh, this is from the hippocampus of um, someone with Alzheimer's campus is that primary memory site um, so I've got some information here about the beta amyloid. I'm going to keep going. You can come back to look at it, but just about its size and how many uh, amino acids there are, uh, where it comes from, how it ends up there. But here's an interesting point. There are three um, uh, approved um, PET scan ligands uh, on the market for detecting alpha, uh, alpha um, uh, uh, beta amyloid. Um, uh, and there are others on the way. All of these use this 18 uh, fluor isotope. Uh, they're working to get more specific and more sensitive um, markers, biomarkers or tracers. 
Now I want to talk quickly about Tau. I'm sorry I've run over. Should I keep going? Reasonably close. Yay or nay? Okay, thank you. One vote, that's okay. We'll consider you're the president of the United States. So one vote overrides everything. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. Um, tau and tauopathies are uh, um, a big focus of, uh, of um, research. Uh, tau is a microtubule associated protein. MAP is the uh, um, acronym. Uh, it stabilizes tubulin that uh, form uh, the microtubules. Now, microtubules are really interesting, and they are the cytostructure of the of the uh, neuron, but also involved in all kinds of processes, especially with actin intermediate fibers. They're always being remodeled. Every time you make a dendrite or a new synapse, you are using quick uh, assembly tubules to bring it into um, um, service. And that depends on a uh, stable system. And tau uh, apparently stabilizes microtubules. And uh, um, there's an interesting history behind the discovery of tau as well, but I won't go into that right now. Um, here's the theory in a nutshell. You have these kinases, they are enzymes that are maybe activated by oxidative stress, maybe free radicals. Uh, so uh, there's a, there are articles that talked about uh, turmeric that I came across that I thought was, in, I take turmeric uh, two capsules uh, twice a day when I can think of it, but uh, uh, they are wonderful uh, as anti-inflammatories. I take them in lieu of uh, ibuprofen or, uh, so I broke my back, I broke three vertebra in uh, 2015, so I get pain uh, pretty easily. Uh, but um, I, I use turmeric for my pain. I never take anything else. I don't want my brain cluttered uh, with opiates. But in any case, these kinases get kicked on. They hyperphosphorylate these tau proteins in the axons. It leads to them grouping in, they're generally, uh, they come out unfolded and they're hydrophilic. They don't seem, you know, folding of uh, uh, proteins uh, occurs uh, so that certain groups in the protein can escape the having to face the water. They're hydrophobic. So this is uh, comfortable just out in the water so it doesn't tend to fold up. Uh, and, uh, any, at any rate, um, they end up um, going from being fairly soluble to becoming insoluble in aggregations. Uh, and the uh, tangles are formed, neurofibrillary tangles. And uh, of course, the uh, benefit of stabilizing microtubules is uh, affected. And if you get a significant amount of dysfunction of microtubules in your neurons, your neurons are going to check out. They're going to stop functioning and then they're going to eventually die. And so that is the, in a nutshell, the best statement of the theory I can give you right now. This is a, now there have been a kind of a holy grail type search for a marker, a biomarker tracer for tau. This is a, a um, a new molecule that's not approved yet, but it's uh, there's excitement about it. So I just wanted to mention uh, fluor tau Um and uh, there is a study in the National Institutes of Aging uh, is recruiting patients at the Washington University for tau PET imaging using this agent. And here I'm not going to spend time on this, but I just started. Oh, I don't know, dwelling on similarities in other, between ta this uh, tracer and other molecules. Uh, so of the uh, possible causes of Alzheimer's, these tangles from, uh, as a tauopathy may be uh, 
one of the most important leads, but it's almost certainly not the only thing going on. There's um, this is really multifactorial, and uh, there's probably going to be a lot of layers. If if tau is the uh, real damaging agent, uh, there's going to be a lot of layers that leads to it becoming that, that way, I'm sure. Uh, people have argued that gum disease, they've noted that people with bad teeth often have uh, dementia, and they found uh, components, bacteria uh, associated with gum disease, in, associated with uh, um, uh, plaques and uh, changes in Alzheimer's, uh, and herpes infection as well. Um, generally, inflammation in all of this plays a big role. Once you get the neurons sick and you get uh, proglia acrophages that are around the neurons angry, they'll start to kill the cell. If they say mutation, trim to mutation that uh, appears to predispose the microglia to being uh, double agents. There's also a section here I wanted to talk very quickly about diabetes, uh, type 3 diabetes. I'm going to flip through here uh, some things because um, it's gotten over. But uh, um, the brain uh, was not considered an insulin target organ when I was in medical school. Um, that's Langerhans. Um, that's uh, two uh, uh, things named after him. The islets of Langerhans, where the beta cells create insulin in the pancreas. Uh, and uh, there are all these other uh, hormones that are secreted, such as this, Graylin. Uh, Graylin. Um, and there's the pancreas, and this is a netter diagram with an islet. This is another, just a diagram showing islets. That's the lay of the uh, uh, pancreas. It's um, back in there um, where in uh, um, historically, if you had an injury back in there, you wouldn't make it. It's uh, too much vital stuff in there. That's the liver that's pulled upwards there. And that's the duodenum to the left. And the spleen in upper right-hand corner. And the stomach is removed there to see the pancreas is that big yellow uh, blob. These are the guys that discovered uh, insulin uh, and got awarded the Nobel Prize. Best and McLeod. Best is the young man. That dog was fed uh, or, or injected with an ex extract of, pan of dog pancreas tissue. That dog was a diabetic and he lived. Only trouble is they were they did that in 1923 and 1916. This um, uh, Count Dracula looking guy uh, actually he looks like a pretty sharp dude for 1916. Uh, Nicholas Alessio of Romania discovered that he could extract um, a material from dogs to treat um, uh, diabetes. And he had it patented in, in 1922, but he never got acknowledged or won the Nobel Prize for it. Here's another person I want you to know about. And if you go back and look at this, take a moment and look at this. This is a really remarkable individual, Dorothy, uh, uh, um, Dorothy um, oh, uh, Crowfoot Hodgkin. Uh, from, um, she was born in Cairo, but she was British. Very shy, uh, reticent, quiet person. Uh, she did wonderful uh, uh, discoveries, uh, developing three-dimensional imaging of cholesterol, penicillin, vitamin B12, and insulin, which had a big impact on, uh, on uh, treatment of diabetes. That was her model for um, penicillin that she discovered on the E-Day. There's uh, Frederick Sanger who sequenced uh, diabetes and um, radioimmunoassay where, where they uh, 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 used markers on uh, things to bond to the insulin to uh, uh, detect it. Uh, 
uh, was developed uh, by uh, uh, Rosalind Yalu. Uh, breast testing for allergies based on her work. And insulin is a big deal. This is a gentleman who had um, mental illness and other problems, and he ended up, he had been in the United States living since he was an infant. He only spoke English. And so ICE got a hold of him and uh, deported him to Iraq, and he couldn't get insulin. He died within a few weeks. So they brought his body back for funeral. And Jimmy Al Dawood. So it's a sad world. Okay. There's a whole section of this. I'm, I'm going to just kind of wrap it up in one uh, statement. The brain appears to have some insulin production. It also has insulin receptors, and it can develop insulin resistance. And I've heard people describing di uh, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, as uh, the brain starving for energy, unable to utilize uh, um, uh, glucose. And, oh, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button stupidly here. Uh, so that's referred to as type 3 diabetes. I wanted you to be aware of it and, and uh, read more about it. Um, and diet as, as well might play a role. In For instance, uh, uh, high dose corn syrup uh, in hamsters uh, induces neuronal insulin resistance. And the blood-brain barrier... Um, protects the brain from molecules getting to it, but the olfactory bulbs and the roof of the nose are, um, well, they, they have, a, through little dural sleeves, these little um, um, processes that drop down into the um, nasal vault. So the um, kind of bare ne neurons of the uh, olfactory bulb uh, are coming down into the top of the nose, and they detect things in solution and that's how you smell things. Well, they can use insulin sprays, and there's evidence that it helps people's mentation when they have dementia. So um, it gives more support to the idea that um, there's an insulin um, resistance component to dementia. So here's my last slide. And... I wrapped it up by just thinking it's a, it's a really complex, uh, arcane thing, the brain, but it's uh, going to be a big thing of study for this, this century. Uh, make your best choices uh, and give it your best shot as you go along, but be careful what you expose yourself to. And um, enjoy learning and sharing and being part of the scientific culture of humanity, but don't worry about wealth or fame. And, Life's rarely fair, but really it doesn't matter. I'm saying that because of thinking of these people that did wonderful work and they don't really get noted for it. We're really uh, more of a collective than anybody wants to admit. We like to make heroes and make it out that uh, there's the loner, the rugged individualist uh, leading the way, but everyone's dependent on... Uh, a, that makes progress for humanity is dependent on uh, at least a part of it being represented in a culture in which they make an impact. These people may not have had their name known, but their work was part of the ongoing push forward. So that's it. Any questions? Thank you. I'm sorry I went over so long. That's my um, that's my um, signature uh, mistake, I guess. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Day and Vic. Bed brain. No, I saw someone talk about bed brain. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Thank you, Tata.
Oh, no, I um, heard of bedroom eyes, <laughs> but I haven't uh, heard of bed, bed brain. No problem. So, um, I, if you do go back and look at the slides, I do hope that was successful in making them so that you can get a fair amount of uh, guidance and uh, information from them just by reading them. Thank you, Arian. Thanks, Chantal. I realized after I'd, um, I thought this would be a good topic to discuss. And I realized uh, when I started to make my outline, what an incredibly detailed and Im immense ob uh, subject it is. Uh, thank you, Mike. And, you know, uh, I was thinking about in, uh, uh, I think it was Office Space where uh, the movie where there was one guy, uh, uh, he was the people person and they were talking to him and they said, what do you really do here? And he says, I'm a people person. What's wrong with you people? He says, I'm the one who explains to the engineers because they can't talk to people. It's not talking to the um, reviewers of the business very well. So he was about to get sacked. Um, but I think that um, medical science is so dependent on physics and chemistry uh, in particular and um, molecular biology, of course. Um, it's, there's um, really more room in medicine for improvement by development of these um, other disciplines that have uh, application in it uh, than by uh, the practice itself. So I guess I'll turn my microphone off now if there's no further questions. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to the group.